Well, hello everyone, this is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to a brand new video series uh, concerning uh, various historical uh, issues uh, that deals with Islam and its origin. And this particular video series we're going to title The Qibla Dilemma, Data versus Interpretation. And uh, if you've been following our uh, video series on this topic in the past with Dr. J. Smith, you know that we have addressed a number of those uh, contradictions between the standard Islamic narrative concerning the change of Qibla direction, the change of the prayer direction, supposedly or allegedly, from uh, towards Jerusalem back towards Mecca, and it happened at a certain period of time according to the Quran. However, uh, our dear brother, uh, a researcher and archaeologist, Dan Gibson, uncovered a lot of data that contradicts this particular narrative. And of course, having said that, no better than Dan Gibson himself can really unpack this contradiction or this tension, let's call it, between the data and the interpretation. And as a result of this, we've invited Dan to join us virtually, and he graciously agreed to do that. So brother, thank you so much. It's an honor really to have you here with us virtually, and hopefully soon we will have you in person to unpack these fascinating uh, discoveries. I remember my f the first time I met you in Canada, I was at a conference, former Muslims, you approached me from behind, you tapped me on the shoulder, and you gave me a book called the uh, Quranic Geography. And I looked at the book, and I really didn't know what to make out of it at that point. Then I looked through it, and I says, gee, I wonder where he got his data from. And then the more I explored it, and the more I start to hear about your research, the more Jay Smith brought it up to my attention, the more I dug deeper, it was so fascinating that there is rich amount of data available for our Muslim friends to see for themselves, just using the Quran alone versus factual data, that there is a problem. And this problem is definitely damaging to that standard Islamic narrative. So thank you again for being here with us. So thank you, Al Fadi. It's good to be here. Um, I, yes, thank you for that introduction. I am a historian, and uh, my interest has always been in the history of the Middle East for as long as I can remember. And uh, I was living in Jordan back in the 1970s, late 1970s, studying Arabic at that time. And um, I was challenged by some Muslim friends to read the Quran. And uh, I began to check out some of the locations because geography was kind of new. I was just in, uh, just beginning my 20s at the very early age. And I read through, um, started reading through the Quran and tried to figure out where things were. And I also was reading hadiths and history, histories and so forth and making myself acquainted with uh, the geography of the Middle East. As somebody growing up in Canada, I didn't know where a lot of places were. I had to figure things out. And I remember actually a few years after that, reading through Ibn Ishaq's uh, history, his story of the, the biography of the, of Muhammad. And, um, I, I, I recognized that it seemed to be talking about Northern Arabia rather than Central Arabia. And that was always in the back of my mind. So I then began checking mosque Qiblas. And that, that's the direction that the mosque faces. In every mosque, as you know, that uh, when people pray, they line up and they face all towards one wall of that mosque. It's called the Qibla wall. And every mosque has an orientation. It's oriented towards uh, the, the focus uh, where Muslims are supposed to pray. And uh, every Muslim that I had ever met said that faces towards Mecca and that faces towards something in Mecca called Masjid al-Haram. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, the holy place that's there. And in that holy place is the Kaaba. And in that Kaaba is a black stone. So they're facing all of those directions when they face uh, their Qibla direction. And so that's always before them. But I noticed that there were mosques that didn't face towards Mecca. And I would ask, and some people say, oh, that faces towards Jerusalem, or 
So things like that. So I began to make a list of early mosques and uh, began checking uh, checking them. And I've got a slide here, slide number one, if we can put that up. In the end of doing my research, uh, this is the number of mosques that I ended up looking at. And, and I started looking at that mess, but I began to realize there were patterns in the way mosques were facing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to unravel that. And I eventually began to look at it and say, I think I can see three patterns that were existing. There were mosques that were facing uh, towards Mecca and Saudi Arabia, but there were mosques that faced in all kinds of other directions. Um, and so I started building this database. If we can jump to, I think it's slide four, um, that will bring us up to the database. Um, and I started listing the mosques, and my list was limited to the first three centuries of Islam. I, I, to do all of Islam would be a huge job. There are thousands and thousands of mosques out there. But I wanted to know about the very earliest mosques, and I wanted to see them done in a pattern from the earliest moving on until uh, through the first three centuries. And I began to, to look and realize there's something there that's, that was different. And um, during this time, we made a film called The, uh, the Sacred City. So maybe we can bring up uh, the, um, the slide. I, sorry, I don't, should have my numbers in front of me. Um, so um, slide, th sorry, slide three. Um, in that film, The Sacred City, we talked about 19 mosques in the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were 13 that were facing, I felt, towards the city of Petra. That is, if you took Petra and then drew a line around it, maybe measured out 100 kilometers on either side and then drew a line around it, these all fit within that, that circle. And there were two that I had that were facing towards Mecca, and there were four that faced between the two. They, they just sort of went right down to an area right between the two. And so there were 19 mosques in that film. And so people have watched it, and I encouraged people to watch it. And people started writing back to me, and uh, we began adding more and more things to the list as we went along. So um, eventually... Um, that database grew to over a hundred mosques that su surviving mosques from the first three centuries of Islam. These are not just mosques that, um, that, you know, you can go look at because there, there are many that, that are there that people say, Oh yeah, this is an early mosque. But when you go to the site, the mosque maybe was built in 1985. They bulldozed everything down and built a new mosque. Right. And maybe that happened four, five, six times through the last thousand and 1500 years. And so I, I looked at those and said, well, I'll put them in the database, but they're in as unknown. And so, uh, out of the, uh, the hundred that we have, there's, there's actually 160 about in the first three centuries, but 60 of them have been so badly damaged and rebuilt and changed that we can't actually measure what it would look like in the first centuries of Islam. So, um, we then come up with, um, this is, I think it's slide four that will show us the, um, the, the surviving mosques and they have four different kiblas that that come That's up. right so i make sure we got the right one up and and now uh, there there were four very distinct areas i gave them names now they're my names i assigned them names um but um the, it, whether i assigned them right or wrong is is another discussion i i felt that there were four distinct uh different kiblas and the very first one well, the earliest Qiblas I call the Petra Qibla because that was right at the center of the circle that uh, where all these mosques seem to be facing. The earliest one was in five uh, after the Hijra, and there are 36 mosques uh, in the over that uh, first 200 years that faced Petra that we have. Um, we can go back and record these are mosques that survived, and we can look at them, and there they are. 
So there were 36 uh, that we have up to date. Um, then there is uh, those mosques in, in North Africa. I call these the parallel ones because uh, just, or sometimes I call them an African mosque. If you hear me, African Qibla. If I'm talking about African Qibla, I'm, it's all the same thing. Um, in the first 300 years of Islamic history, there are 15 that survive that we can look at. There are many more that, that come, that, that we can, can look at that come in the, in the fourth century, in the fifth century, and so forth. So, and those began in 58 after the Hijra. There were none before that. So we can go back and look at the date. Say the earliest one comes from about 58 after the Hijra. There uh, then started to what I call the between Qiblas, and that, that started in 87 after the, after the Hijra. And in that uh, first three centuries of Islamic history, 36 mosques were built. Many of these major mosques that faced what I call the between position. I have reasons for calling it the between Qibla, the between position. And uh, then at 109 after the Hijjah, this is a, more than a century after the first uh, beginning after the Hijra of, of Islam, uh, there are, there started to be mosques facing Mecca. Now, right. maybe there's some before 109 that didn't survive, and so I haven't been able to find them or have been so totally rebuilt that we can't measure them. But we have 19 mosques only that face in, in that period of time. Now, so, uh, if I may comment, go ahead. Uh, Th that's the overall data. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's really interesting, of course, this particular slide that everybody's watching right now, uh, because I have done this show a couple of times before with Jay, and I'm familiar with your um, you know data in terms of what you mean by the Petra Qibla, by the Peril Qibla, by the Between Qibla and the Mecca. Uh, just I want to give people a quick overview here because I'm, I want to make a comment. The Petra Qibla, uh, Qibla obviously facing Petra. Parallel was between Petra and Mecca. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, North Africa, parallel to the direction of, you know, between Petra and Mecca. Uh, between Qibla, it's directed to something between Mecca and Petra. And finally, the Mecca, you know, it's, it's as the name says, face in Mecca. It's kind of interesting because it puts a different spin on the traditional uh, or narrative of Islam, because it seemed like the spread of knowledge about prayer, at least, and the Qibla started from Petra, went to North Africa, and then went east to what we call the, uh, you know, the uh, Abbasids, you know, basically a dynasty, and then went south from there to Mecca. So uh, I just want people to be aware of that. If we use this data and use the dating of this mosque, it seemed like uh, the Islam started it somewhere different than Mecca, because you would expect it to start in Mecca, meaning the earliest it should be in Mecca, making its way up north to Petra versus the opposite. That's right. Let's put up slide uh, number five, and this is the the, the mosques that face towards Petra, um, and they're from north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so the, these these all from these various directions are all facing towards Petra. This is what I didn't expect because these are the earliest mosques. These are from the very first century of Islam. Right. Um, I, you know, this this is. It, it just totally contradicted. I couldn't believe it when I found it. It's still um, amazing to look at because it contradicts absolutely everything that every Muslim has told me or that I've read in all the Islamic literature. Petra's not mentioned anywhere. And so that becomes a problem. Um, how and why are these mosques facing in this direction? Right, right. Okay, so if we bring up the next slide, which is six of... I think we're going to six. Oh, my, my pictures are all backwards. Okay, sorry. No problem. Um, there we go. Six is uh, the ones pointing to Mecca. There are a few right. that are pointing to Mecca. There's 19 in that uh, first 300 years. So, and the first 100 years, nothing. And then the next 200 years, there are only 19 surviving mosques. Uh, and then face in Mecca. The, There's yeah, the face first 100 Mecca. years, and then nothing. If face we in go Mecca. to... Yeah. Yeah. Go to slide seven, and then we see this is very strange. Why are there so many mosques that face between Petra and Mecca? Correct. And so this data was, was very startling. Now, what happens is that this is the data. This is what we need to 
uh, give a, an answer for. We need to come up with some reason why the, these mosques face in these directions. What I find interesting is that there are no erroneous mosques. They're not mosques just pointing off in some random direction. They all fit the pattern of, of these uh, four different Qibla directions. Right. So, so we need to come up with an explanation. And uh, when I come up with an explanation, lots of people have arguments. And, and that's fine. But there's a difference between what the data says and what the theories are going to say about why this occurs. That's right. So, so we're going to end up talking about theories. And if people want to shoot down my theory of why this occurs, I'm fine. We can discuss that. They may have their reasons. But we also need to go back and say, so then what does this mean? If my interpretation, it doesn't satisfy you, then please come up with your own interpretation of Absolutely. what is going on here. Absolutely. And that will be, of course, for the second part of this particular video series, where we're going to talk about the data versus the interpretation. And I want to say this, uh, Dan, may maybe the comparison I'm going to use may not be as uh, equivalent to, to this. But, you know, I watch a lot of uh, crime investigations and, and there is something called DNA. Um, whenever you have a DNA, it is very hard for anyone to dispute against it. It's a fact. It's the data. DNA says you were here at this location. You can come up with any excuses why you weren't there, but the DNA disputes your argument. Same thing we're doing here. You have DNA is pointing the Qibla toward different locations, multiple mosques. You're not do, saying one mosque was towards Petra, one towards Mecca. No, we're talking a lot of mosques, which means that there is repetition uh, of results. There is uh, more data that adding to the findings. And like you stated it clearly, we don't need attacks. You're actually welcoming anyone to challenge it uh, scientifically and uh, prove or disprove. I mean, uh, the idea here, you don't feel like you own it. You're just putting it out there for people to do something about. We need to understand, for instance, for instance, when I look at something called the Between Qibla, what was between Petra and Mecca? Was there a shrine there? Was there an eye? I mean, I have to understand why it's not a coincidence that it was pointing to that direction, not one by mistake, not two. We're th talking 36 mosques. I mean, there has to be an explanation, obviously for all of That's that. That's 36 from the first three, three centuries. There yeah. are many more after that. Right. We're right. going to get into that discussion Wonderful. Uh, in a later video of, of what that is. We're, we're only dealing here in this video with the first three centuries of Islam. Yep. Thank you and uh, for, for pointing that out. And thank you, everyone, of course, for joining us. And hopefully you find this particular video to be exciting. And uh, I'm pretty sure the next one, part two of this particular discussion that we called Qibla Dilemma Data versus Interpretation. And we gave uh, right now uh, our laid out at least the introduction to the data collection. And now in part two of this particular series, we're going to talk now about the compa comparison between the data and the interpretation. And at least in this case, we're talking about Dan Gibson's interpretation. So uh, let's keep in mind, uh, when you are a researcher or a scientist, you're entitled really to reach your own conclusions. And uh, people tend to attack these conclusions without doing their own counter research. And that's what we're trying to point out here. Do your counter research, present your data, argue it from a scientific standpoint, and that's okay. Let's put it out in a public arena for others to examine. Brother, thank you so much, as always. And please, go ahead, uh, finish your thought. Yeah, I think you have. I just yeah. wanted to know if we have time to do just uh, two quick questions. Absolutely, Some please. Of the questions yes. people have is, how, did you, how do you check a mosque? And so uh, if we, we look at uh, slide nine, uh, what we do is, is we looked at, I looked at archaeological reports because archaeologists have already visited these places. They've measured, they've taken pictures, they've got diagrams. I can, can go by, by the studies that archaeologists have already made. I also used satellite, uh, well, visiting is, is the best way. Of course. And many mosques, you have to actually go to and visit. And I visited many of these mosques and right 
right now, there are several other scholars who are working uh, alongside. Uh, I'm collaborating with them. They Right now, as we speak, there is one in the Middle East. He's got a whole list of different mosques that he is going to and visiting on the ground and, and doing the checks there because uh, because we were having trouble from satellite photos, which is the other one we use, mm -hmm. to look at, to look down at. And sometimes uh, if the mosque, if a new mosque has been built on top of a second one, so it's on the second floor, you can't see that original mosque. So Correct. it needs a visit. It, someone to go there and actually do the measurement. So that's how we got the data. And on the next slide, the slide 10, question is how do you date a mosque? Because how do I know it's in the first three centuries of Islam? So again, we go back to archaeological reports. Uh, many of these have archaeologists have visited, they've made reports. Some of it depends on the pottery that's found there. Uh, people check, there's pottery can be easily dated. Coins, ancient coins found in an excavation help them date. Mortar is the stuff put between stones. And so they mix up mortar with some gravel and who knows what's in that mortar. And so often they take the mortar and look to see what well, that's where you find sometimes the pottery and the stones and you can date, hey, this is actually, this is when that mosque was built, that pottery and that those coins were lying around here. And uh, then there's ancient manuscripts. There are lots, lots of times we're reading the histories and it tells us that the army reached this point on this date. And so we know, okay, the Muslims arrive and this help us date, especially if it says, and they built a mosque. And some mosques are actually dated because they're mentioned in ancient manuscripts. So uh, we have um, done careful study of this. And uh, so, so uh, the data is there. And I challenge people, if you don't like the way we measured a mosque, please go and measure it again and come back to us. We, we are willing to reconsider and look at each individual mosque and have it dated. But there are uh, other archaeologists who are looking at that. And so this data is actually have other people, peers of mine who are checking people with degrees in archaeology, people with degrees in statistics are looking and checking at data. And, and that's the, the important thing. We want this data to be trustworthy. Absolutely. And I'm thankful that at least uh, your research has prompted some of this interest. And uh, I pray and hope that uh, many of these uh, researchers archaeologists, stat statisticians, or others uh, will benefit at least from what you have done, whether their findings will corroborate or not. It's irrelevant. The idea is that's what the uh, field of research is all about. We help one another. And yes, there is a, you know, there is a way to critique someone else's research, but we need to keep it also in a civil fashion. We need to just build upon each other's research and correct one another if necessary, based on facts, data, and findings. So thank you, brother, for uh, your time. And of course, next uh, episode, we are going to begin to address the topic of data and the tension between the data and the interpretation. Until then, have a blessed day, everyone. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.